Amen. Amazing. Hello, friends in the room. Hello, friends in Fort Worth and friends in Houston. Uh, I am uh, going to start with a story that will kind of give us traction for where we're going. I have a 10-week-old son named Crew. Last week, I was going to <laughs> get excited. Last week, I was uh, going to uh, pick him up to leave for work in the morning, and um, I went and picked him up uh, and um, just held him, gave him a hug, and as I'm holding him, I realize he's got this like cross-eyed look, which is not that unusual going on in his face, but something's going on, and, um, and he looked like milk drunk, which is also not uncommon, because he, he loves milk, and I'm looking at him, I'm like, all right, buddy, goodbye, and, uh, and right as I go to like kiss him on the cheek, I get milk thrown up all over my face. It is a Got Milk commercial gone bad, all over my face, it's all over the floor, and I'm like, oh my gosh. And uh, the reason uh, why he had thrown up is because, um, really, he, he does this all the time. It's not because he's sick, he's in this weird stage of life where like he can't get enough milk, and even if he uh, drinks until he's full, he throws up, and then he wants more. He's just a little milk monster wanting to go to Dairy Queen all the time. And so he comes up, and he's, he's throwing up all my face, and, uh, and I'm cleaning this up. Of course, he wants more milk, and uh, we're like, buddy, you're okay. You don't need any more milk. It's okay. He's crying. He goes ballistic if he doesn't get more milk, and, uh, and so we live in this world right now where uh, we are constantly having to deal with this uh, 10-week-old who, even though he has more than enough... He is discontent and wants to have more. He just purges out and wants more milk for whatever reason. It helps him soothe. It helps him find comfort. Um, And the fact that he has enough is not enough for him. He's discontent despite having enough. And the reason I start there is because tonight, like Shane said, we are talking about the uh, topic of money. And the topic of discontentment, because the idea of an infant uh, wanting more milk despite he's full and, hey, I had enough, but I still want more, is kind of okay for an infant uh, when he's in that little stage. But honestly, I think if most of us were honest, we would say that stage of being discontent despite having enough, I still want more, despite having enough, I still want more and more and more, is not something that is only for infants and only related to milk, but is very related to the topic of money. Most of us in the room came into the room with probably more than enough. In a global perspective, we'd say we have more than enough, but there's still something inside of us that is discontent and wants more, wants more, wants more. And if that wasn't bad enough, we live in a world and social media has made this so we further are exposed and further encouraged to be discontent because everywhere we look, we are exposed to how much we're missing out on, how much everyone else is getting to do that's fun. And you can, with a click of a button, go and see, oh my gosh, Instagram. Oh, they're in Maui again. I hate them. Oh man, I wish my job allowed me to travel like that. Oh, I wish I could drive a new car like that. Oh, I wish I was self-employed. I wish I made that kind of money. I wish I had that many pairs of shoes or I wish I had that many or insert Pinterest or whatever it is. We are in this culture and in this place and time where we're further exposed to how much we don't have, further enabled to be more and more discontent. In fact, tonight, as it relates to the topic of money, we strategically planted inside of this room uh, and inside of Fort Worth uh, a few hundred dollars uh, to further drive some discontentment and to use as an illustration later in this message. And so underneath some of your seats right now, you can look and there is a $100 bill, there's a $50 bill. I'm not kidding. I would look if I were you. It's in your seat right now. Not directly underneath. It's on the back of your seat pad. There's an envelope. If you found it, there should be one right down here. There should be one somewhere over here. <laughs> yeah, people are checking other chairs. I love it. They're starting to move. This is fantastic. Oh, man, if you were not discontent before, you are now. <laughs> there is. Yeah, there you go. There's one. Uh, there's some in Fort Worth, too, directly underneath your chair, on the back of your seat. If you don't get it, there should be at least six in this room. And, uh, and we're going to come back to why those are there. <laughs> um, but congratulations if you're sitting in one of those chairs. Underneath the back. Does that make sense? So it's not directly underneath to where you could see it. It's on the very back of your chair. You'd have to like, if you reached a hand directly behind you. Oh, there you go. Okay. Don't reach back and grab somebody's leg. Just reach back and you may find it. Um, okay, here we go. We're going to keep going. <laughs> Everyone, I've lost the crowd. Let me close in prayer and we'll end uh, tonight. We got one, two. I bet we have six. 
So if you don't have it, you can look afterwards and you'll be able to find it. Here's why we, uh, are, actually, I'm going to come back to why there's a men's strategic plan in there. But if you weren't discontinued before, you are now. And uh, as we topically address the subject of money and how we, as we enter into the world of adulting or really enter into what it looks like as followers of Christ to handle money, uh, we want to dive into a passage in 1 Timothy 6. If you have a Bible, you can flip open there because we live in a world, like we just said, that fuels this idea of discontent, that fuels the desire to get more and more and more and more and more money. And the Apostle Paul is going to say that desire, that uh, discontent, that you did not just uh, come into the room and get gain discontent by that $100. In other words, all of us came in and before we had ever known that the person sitting next to us just got 50 bucks, we were discontent. And we're going to come back to why those were put in the places that they were. But all of us came in and the Apostle Paul is about to lay out that there is a remedy for discontentment. But he's also going to lay out that there is an extreme danger in discontentment. And the danger is not just, oh, you know, you're going to have a bad day. What he says is at stake is not just your future, but your faith. That it has the potential to erode and destroy your faith, which will then destroy every aspect of your life. And so what the Apostle Paul is going to lay out as we explore the topic of contentment and money and what the scripture says about these two. We're gonna start in verse uh, six of chapter six. So if you have a Bible, flip to 1 Timothy chapter six, starting in verse six. If you don't, it'll be up on the screen. 1 Timothy is a book written to Timothy, uh, and it was written by the Apostle Paul to this young church leader who's named Timothy. He's a young adult. He's leading this church in Ephesus, and he had been mentored by Paul. Paul was like a, uh, he was Paul's protege, if you will. Paul mentored him, and he writes this letter to this young adult who's leading this church, and he begins to attack or address the topic of money and contentment. And we're diving into a conversation that had already been taking place in the verses before it, where he's uh, addressing false teachers who had come up, who had said godliness is a means to get financial gain. That's in the verse right before it, if you wanna go back and read it later. Basically, he's saying, look out for people who are gonna come, and they're gonna say, look, if you're godly, you're gonna get more money. If you give God a dollar, he's gonna give you 10. That's the kind of person, Timothy, you need to stay away from. That person is uh, not doing the Lord's work, he says. Godliness is a means of financial gain is corrupt. But there is a godliness that leads to a gain, and it involves something else along the topic of commitment. So verse 6, here we go. We're going to start out with this first idea from the text of contentment has nothing to do with money. And if you're sitting next to the person with $50, you may not believe me now, but hopefully by the end of this message, you will. Contentment has nothing to do with money. Here's what he says in verse 6. Don't be fooled by those who have uh, said godliness is a way to get financial gain, but here's where gain is. But godliness with contentment is great gain. So he's contrasting the idea of financial gain, and he says, look, there is a great gain that comes from godliness, but it is a godliness that is paired up with contentment, that I'm okay, I'm satisfied, I don't have to have more, I'm not in constant need of wanting more and more and more stuff. That if you have a discontentment problem, your solution, money is not the answer to your problem. In other words, getting more and more, what he says, he says there is no relationship between contentment and money. If you get more money, you will not be any more content, the Apostle Paul says. If you get more and more, you will not be any more content. The more you have, not necessarily the more or the less that you want. Getting more will not leave you wanting less. Like we know this, right? Like there isn't a relationship between our, our happiness in life, or our contentment in life, our joy, our satisfaction, and the things that we acquire. There is for like an hour and a half, and then it's like, ah, this is kind of worthless. I want the next one. Like we live in a world where uh, constantly, especially as Americans, uh, probably the clearest way you see this is like with your phone, right? Like who has the iPhone 6 right here? Anybody? Who has the iPhone 6S? Oh my gosh, I love it. Uh, you, we live in a world where we're constantly being bombarded with, hey, upgrade, 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 get this next one. And when we get it, it's like, this is awesome. I'm gonna keep this clean for like three days. And then it's got a spider web on it. And you're like, I hate this thing. When's the iPhone 7 coming out? We live in a world that's constantly saying, if you will just uh, get more, get more, get more, especially as America. Like we are so good at this and we are so engaged in trying to get more. We don't even allow our stuff to be replaced anymore. We do something called upgrade. Have you ever thought about that? Like nobody in this room or most of us in this room weren't like, you know what happened? I was using the iPhone one and then it started disintegrating. And so I moved up to the six 
We just go, what, you're still on the four? You know, you can upgrade for free, and by free I mean $25 a month, but you can still upgrade, it's called Next. We don't even allow, uh, we don't replace things anymore. We drive a car till it's 100,000 miles, and we're like, I think I should trade this in. I'm not sure what to do with it beyond this. We don't even replace things like a TV. You're like, there's, a, there's an LED, this LCD. <laughs> this thing is worthless. I need to upgrade. We no longer live in a world where we're like, oh, things need to be replaced. We're so good at getting more and more and more. And yet at the same time, if we were all honest, we're going, it's not gonna bring any more satisfaction in your life. And that's the Apostle Paul's point. Like there is no relationship between contentment, between your standard of living and your income or the amount of stuff that you have. I mean, this is so huge. This means that right now, as much as I think all of us would go, man, I could really use more money. I would like to make more money. The Apostle Paul says your standard of, or your contentment in life, your joy, your happiness, you could double your salary right now and you would still, if you are discontent, find yourself discontent or find yourself wanting more. In other words, if you make $50,000, and we say, oh, tomorrow you make $100,000, you will then just move everything up and still find yourself wanting more and more and more, this appetite. And the Apostle Paul says, do not be fooled. Gain and great gain in this world has nothing to do with money. Contentment is not found in having money. Don't buy the lie that the world around you is trying to sell you. And he gives an indication further into uh, a, a truth about money. He says this, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. So the Apostle Paul says, look, you brought nothing into this world. Here's the second idea about money. This is not our second point. First in this one, or the, just another idea within this passage, is he says, look, money, the idea of uh, you bring nothing into this world and you take nothing out of it means this. You are a steward. You are not an owner. Just like you came into this world with nothing, you will die with nothing. You cannot take anything with you. Everything that you have is passing through your hands like sand. You do not own any of it. You are a steward of all of it. And the Apostle Paul says, look, uh, Steve Jobs right now is worth zero. If great gain is only about getting more and more and more and more money, then at the end of our life, there's no such thing as gain because you lose everything. And he says, look, we brought nothing in, we'll take nothing out, there is a gain, but it has nothing to do with how much money you get. And while you're here on this earth, you are not an owner, you are a steward of every dollar that you have. It's all temporarily in your hands and it's all leaving. And the Bible says for followers of Christ, as a steward, you are a steward and not an owner, which means every dollar that you have, you are stewarding, you're managing God's Money. Now, why did we put money in the chairs of uh, six people in this room and I think six people in Fort Worth? To illustrate this point, those of you who got that money, if you have the $100, if you have the 20s, or if you have the 50, whatever amount that you got, we want you to use that money for a specific purpose, not on yourself, but on a kingdom investment. We want you to take that money and we want to use it towards some organization that is Christ. Uh, for the cause of Christ, if you will, whether you're in Fort Worth or whether you're in Dallas, we're asking, do not use that money on yourself. We're saying this is a kingdom investment. You are to steward uh, this investment. You are not the owner of it. You are a steward of it. Now, everyone in the room that was jealous of not getting the $100 is a little less jealous. Have you noticed that? We're like, oh, you can't even use it on themselves. I don't care about that anymore. That's how we're s- to see all money. It's not yours and it's not mine. That just like in that situation, like, oh, I get it. They don't even really get to use it for themselves. They're supposed to like steward it. That's how we're to see every dollar that passes through your hands and it passes through mine. And even the fact that there's a little bit of like, oh, I'm kind of sadder that I can't use this uh, to make myself happier reflects the idea that we don't believe what Paul is saying is true. Money has nothing to do with contentment with happiness, but he's about to lay out why contentment is not, or discontentment is not something to play with, but it is a danger that will destroy your life. life. And it is something that is a sin that leads you down a path like few other sins in scripture, especially in the language he's about to use, as it says, to this idea of getting more and more, AKA greed, and how dangerous it is. Here's what he says. Verse nine, those who want to get rich not those who are rich, 
Those who want, or the word long, strongly desire. Those who lust after riches. Those who want to live more richly. Those who direct the course of their life to getting more and to getting more and to getting more. They fall into temptation and a trap. And into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. I mean, look at the language he's using. The people who want to get rich, they fall into a trap. And they plunge themselves. They lead themselves into a situation where of ruin and destruction. I think the two traps, and it's such a perfect word, because a lot of us, I think, in the room, as we describe our financial situation, what do you feel? Trapped. Like, I'm in a car where I'm upside down. I'm in a lease where I can't really afford it. I have to stay at this job right now. Because I cannot afford to leave because it would mean my standard of living would have to decrease. I'd have to get rid of the car. I'm trapped. And the Apostle Paul says, look, you, like every other person in our world, especially in America, is in danger. If you do not have a hold on your discontent, it will lead you down a path towards destruction. Our second idea is the danger of discontentment where the Apostle Paul lays out it is a trap. I think the trap takes place in two different ways that we see described in Scripture. One trap that scripture lays out as it relates to money is that the um, deceitfulness of money is that you never think you have enough. Like no matter how much you get, you're like, oh, I need a few more dollars. I wish I could get a little bit richer. Ecclesiastes 5, the richest man ever, Solomon says this idea about, hey, whoever loves money will never have enough. John Rockefeller, who uh, was worth 340 billion, he makes Bill Gates look like a beginner. 340 billion was asked famously, hey, how much money would be enough for you? One more dollar. Rich is a moving target. That's the danger of riches and pursuing riches because you are chasing a rabbit that will always remain in front of you no matter how uh, far you run on the track. And the danger of riches is that they will never, ever be enough. Even today, uh, not long ago, this year, in May of this year, NBC put out a survey studying millionaires in our nation. People who made between one and five million dollars. NBC surveyed a bunch of millionaires. These are multi-millionaires. I make multi-million a year. And they asked them how they perceived themselves and how they looked at themselves. Four percent thought they were rich. In other words, if you make between one and five million dollars, a multi-million, only four percent the vast majority was like, I'm middle class. I'm a blue collar guy, just like you. I mean, it's insane. Think about that. But that's the deceitfulness of riches is you'll never have enough. You're gonna be in this trap. I need to make more, I need to make more. And then your lifestyle is gonna rise with that. So then you will be trapped into having to make more. That's the second idea is really the trap of riches and the trap of pursuing to be riches is all of a sudden, not only as our income goes up, our standard of living will go up with it and we put golden handcuffs on ourselves. And we end up finding uh, men with incredible anxiety who make $300,000 a year, but they're going, how am I gonna afford private school? We got this yacht. How am I gonna afford all these things? And they put golden handcuffs on themselves and live a life filled with anxiety, filled with discontentment. And Paul says, look, if you allow this trap to take you down the path of discontentment, if you do not get a hold on this appetite that is not uh, relieved by feeding it more, but by being controlled, and we're going to talk about how that takes place. If you don't get a troll, it will lead you down a path towards destruction and something even worse for the love of money, Timothy. This is a very misquoted verse. For the love of money, not money is the root of all kinds of evil, not all evil. It's often quoted, uh, money is the root of all evil. That is not in the Bible. For the love of money, the lust for more, is the root of all kinds of evil. It's the reason many of you have parents who divorced. It's the reason much of the subprime mortgage uh, just uh, circumstances that we found ourselves in in 2008 and the catastrophe, catastrophe, and the catastrophe, and the catastrophe that took place after that took place. Greed, the love of money, is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people, Timothy, and you can almost hear the emotion in his voice, eager for more money, have wandered away from the faith, and they pierced themselves with many griefs. 
Some people, Timothy, they've taken just one step after the next and all of a sudden they found themselves in a situation where they can't leave their job anymore and they can't uh, be a part of a local church anymore. They can't serve God anymore. They can't give anymore because they've made decisions that have taken them down a financial path and all of a sudden it's led them even away from their own faith. I mean, think about that. How extreme is the language he's using here where they pierce themselves. When else does Paul talk like this? And he's saying, Timothy, watch out. The power of greed can lead you down a path that is even away from God. And you'll walk away from your faith without even realizing it. The danger of discontentment. I know in this room, the trap has manifested itself in a lot of different ways. It's kept you, some of you, in a job where you're like, yeah, of course I have to keep working in eye banking because I have bills to pay. I have this car that I have. I'm, I'm leasing a BMW, duh. Of course I have to continue to uh, work at this bar. The tips are unbelievable. Money has made this trap. Some of you are going, I can't get married yet. I'm gonna keep dating Beverly for the next seven years because I can't afford it. I got all kinds of debt that are coming. Some of you are going, I need to get married because I need a sugar mama who can help pay down this debt and is driving all kinds of different decisions in this room. And especially as it relates to debt, man, this, and this is a side note, it's a tangent. <laughs> tangent. Um, I know the averages for the debt amounts in this room as it relates to credit card and college loans are out of control. And some of you were fortunate enough to have parents who paid all the way through college and others of you were not able to do that. But wherever you are in that spectrum, please use this season right now. If you are staring down the barrel of a lot of debt, you too in Fort Worth, to pay off that debt, that is something you do not want to bring with you into marriage. You are going to bring those financial problems, financial stresses into marriage. So do whatever you have to, to begin to pay that down, hopefully get rid of it. But you do not want to carry those things with you into marriage where you have to go, oh yeah, look, I want you to meet my friend. You heard of Master P? Here's MasterCard. This is come on with me. Here, I want you to meet my friend. Not Lisa, this is Visa. And this is my $10,000 debt. And I'm bringing it with me. And here's the twins called Student Loans. And they're with me to stay too, where you don't have to bring those things in and add anything else to the beginning of a marriage. Use this season. Please use this season to begin to pay off that debt. Make cuts wherever you need to. A, a car. Maybe you got to downgrade from the Forerunner and just get a Corolla. I don't know. Corollas are great. Downgrade from the and Forerunners are great too. But do whatever you have to do financially. Set yourself in a place where you can pursue oneness, pursue marriage, and be on the right step towards that. And be ready for when God brings that right person or right someone along. All right, here we go. Keep going. The cure for discontentment. So Paul lays out, he's saying, look, there's a danger in discontentment. It will lead you astray. It can even lead you away from God, but there is a cure, Timothy, and I want you to know about it. And Paul's life really models the cure as well as anyone that I know. And he says this in verse 11. But you, O man of God, as we explore the third point, the cure for discontentment is Christ. The cure for discontentment is Christ. But you, verse 11, Man of God, flee from all of this. What is all of this? Materialism, the desire for more, the fact that, yes, of course I have to have an iPhone. Of course I have to drive this kind of car. Of course I have to live in this area. Of course I have to uh, get newer clothes. Hey, flee from all of that. There's only two times, his language is so extreme in this passage, two times the Apostle Paul talks about fleeing something. One of them is sexuality. And I think a lot of us are going, and yes, I want to be on guard. I'm at least aware of the fact that I should flee from this. And the other place he talks about it is right here where he says, look, flee materialism. It's going to suck you down a culture. You're going to step onto a path that will not end until it has destroyed you, destroyed your future, and destroyed even your faith. And the fact that you don't believe me is just a testament to the fact that you may be moving in that direction. He says, look, greed, like very few other things, Timothy, flee. Don't be careful with it. Don't get in the cage with a lion and say, I'm just gonna be careful in here. He says, when it comes to the topic of greed and money, flee from it. Run in the opposite direction, in this direction, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. I think personally this week, I was like so convicted because I, like you, live in Dallas in a culture where we are constantly being pushed towards keeping up with the Joneses, keeping up with 
making more, dressing a certain way, having a certain amount, living in a certain neighborhood, buying a home by a certain age. And all around me, I can feel this pressure to have more and more, and I need more and more and more, and I feel this inside of my heart. And I think I came in to even studying for this message very aware that, hey, I'm a pervert as it relates to lust. I need covenant eyes on everything I own. I know my temptations is gonna be to uh, long after someone who's not my wife, so I wanna make sure I keep that in front of my community. I keep that in check. I'm very much, I wanna flee from that. And I don't think that I do this where I flee from materialism like the scripture calls me to. And even in the shows that I watch and just navigating, what am I feeding my heart? We just did a um, remodel in a home. Uh, we, uh, one of our favorite shows is Fixer Upper. And even watching that, I was like, oh my gosh, I continue to feel this desire for more and more. Like I'm feeding this discontent and being convicted of like, Lord, what am I feeding my heart? How am I being led and deceived down this path? Will you help me? to experience the cure for that discontentment which is found in Christ alone, which is why he tells Timothy, look, don't just run away from it. Don't just be intentional about what you're feeding your heart, who you're surrounding yourself with, how you're spending. I want you to pursue faithfulness, things of the faith. I want you to pursue Christ. And here's what I think Paul knew. And I'll close um, with just talking a little bit about Paul's life and then about this true treasure that the scriptures reveal that Paul knew of which is Christ. Paul, who instructs Timothy, I want you to run after faithfulness. I want you to run after faith, love, endurance, righteousness. I want you to run after all of these qualities that are found in your faith, found in Christ. I think Paul knew that when you do that, Timothy, if that's the pursuit of your life, in other words, you could just insert for all of those, pursue after Christ, When you do that, Timothy, what you will discover is he is the greatest treasure of this life. Your hands will all of a sudden be opened up because you're encountering the greatest treasure, the truest treasure. In other words, the cure for contentment and the cure for discontentment in your life and mine is not just me saying like, look, be fine with what you have. You got great treasures. You should like them, hold on to them, but it's finding a superior treasure in Christ. Like what other hope do we have as it relates to discontentment? Really? And we're just going to like, oh, I'm fine. I don't want any more. We live in a city. We live in a world that's going to constantly push us to the edge. And Christ and all of that, the only remedy for the cure of discontentment or to find a cure for discontentment is to find the superior treasure, the truest treasure, who is Christ. And Paul instructs Timothy, look, run after this and you will discover the one who is worth giving everything up, the one who makes every other earthly treasure look so small the one where true life is found, the one who Paul says about in Philippians 3 as it relates to everything in his world, he says this about Christ, that knowing him, knowing the true treasure that's Jesus has broken the chains of discontentment in Paul's life. And he says this, verse eight of chapter three in Philippians, I consider everything loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord, For whose sake I have lost everything. Paul, you lost everything. I lost my house. I lost my job. I lost my income. I lost everything. Man, Paul, that must be rough. Not for me. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection, to participate in his sufferings, become like him in his death, and so attaining the resurrection of the dead. Paul says, look, I've lost everything, and I don't even care about it. It's all garbage, or the word dung. It's all trash to me. I've lost it all, and I don't care because the greatest thing in my life is the truest treasure. Every other treasure shrunk and became so small in comparison to knowing Christ. And I read that, and I'm like you, and maybe you're, you're someone who's like, oh, dude, I, I am Amish, and I don't have anything. I live in the city, and I, that feels so far from me. And I want that to be the story of my life where I go, look, everything, God, I want it to all shrink away compared to the truest treasure, which is Jesus. 
I don't want to spend my life chasing little trinkets. When am I going to a newer car? I drive a 2004 Tahoe. I don't want to spend it going, when can I upgrade on Craigslist to the 2010? I want to spend my life pursuing Jesus. And the only way that I know how to get there is by looking at what the Apostle Paul says made it happen to him is when he began to discover through knowing Christ, I can see that Jesus is the greatest treasure, the truest treasure, the treasure of all existence. The treasure that we're going to worship for all of existence, for all of eternity. And the thing that will free your hands up from your greed. The thing that will allow you to be generous is not by just going, I'm going to try harder and I want to feel guilty. But by knowing Christ and in knowing him, you see the truest treasure, the greatest treasure Even the story that we find of this idea of treasure in heaven. When you read in Revelation 21, and I'm going to close right here. When you read in Revelation 21 and John, the apostle John, who was one of Jesus's best friend, he writes about heaven and he begins to describe what heaven's like. And even the terms and the materials that make up heaven. The things uh, that are used for building materials, the things for asphalt. It's it's like he uses everything that we value in this world. He looks around and he says, look, the the streets, it's like they're made of gold. The sheetrock up there, it's pearls and emeralds and all these different diamonds and all these different uh, jewels. And he says, everywhere that you look around and he begins to tell out as though he's sending us a message that the things that we value in this life. The things that we think are so valuable, especially his audience would have in the first century. Emeralds, he says, yeah. Gold, yeah. It's like when you get there, they're asphalt. They're nothing. All the things you treasure in this life, when you get to heaven, one day we're all going to see all these earthly treasures are pushed aside to make way for the treasure of the ages whose name is Jesus. And in this life, the thing that will free you and I up from discontentment from wanting more treasure is knowing the truest treasure, the treasure of all life. And as I like wrestled with even just this message and we were going, hey, we wanna cover money, we wanna cover how we can steward God's resources. And we think all of you should. What's gonna change your discontentment And this is a huge epidemic in our city, in my heart, and I know in this room. What's gonna change uh, your heart is not gonna be some message on money, it's gonna be encountering Jesus and seeing him. The Bible even says that's how we're changed, is when we're introduced to the truest treasure. And the apostle Paul writes and he says, look, I have found it. And in another place he says, I know the secret of being content, and it's Jesus. I know the secret of being generous, and it's Jesus. And the remedy for your greed and for mine is him, is him. As we just explore this topic of money, we know there are people all across the board on the spectrum of finances. And some of you feel in a place where you're going, I feel trapped. We would love uh, to talk with you more, but there is a class that I think everyone in this room should take called Money Wise. Whereas you walk through finances, you don't have to do it alone. You don't even have to do it just with your community. We'd encourage you, but you can have financial counselors who come around, equip and care for. And we think, there's, we think everyone should give. If you were given that money, please give. Do not give it here. Give it to some kingdom-minded organization, and we hope you're generous, but more than any of that, we think that the, the right path to step onto The thing that will break the chains of discontentment, break the golden handcuffs, is gonna be knowing the true treasure. And if you know him and you're pursuing him, everything else will fall into place. Well, David, how much should I give? What does it look like to steward really well? If you're pursuing the true treasure, it'll work itself out. Be generous as you reflect the God who you worship who's generous, generous enough to even give his son. But it's him, it's Jesus. And this whole message of money is just to showcase and show him. He's the remedy for our discontentment. He's the one who can bring change. He's the one that Paul says, everything else I push aside with ease just to know him. I'm gonna pray that we would. Let me pray. Father, thank you. 
for some of us, you have introduced us already to the true treasure, our Savior. I pray that, Lord, I wanna, I wanna treasure Jesus. I wanna say with Paul that everything else is a loss compared to knowing you. Would you help us, Lord, we're so easily distracted Would you help us to know, pursue, step onto that path of seeing Jesus as the true treasure, the treasure that one day we will see he's always been the most valuable thing. He'll always be the most valuable thing. We pray that that would take place before we go to heaven or even the building materials testify, you're the treasure, you're the king. We worship you now. Would you convince us of that reality that you are our treasure?